serious question. Just how distracted are you right now at this very moment? I mean, okay, sure, you're watching this video online right now, but what else are you doing? Checking your email, skimming around news sites, listening to Keisha? Are you really focusing on any of it at all? And more to the point, can you? Well, it's a question that's been given some extra punch lately in a provocative new book called The Shallows, What the Internet is Doing to Our Brains. Its author is writer and journalist Nicholas Carr, who joins us by Skype from Colorado. Mr. Carr, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, and okay, be honest with us. Are you multitasking at this very moment? I I'm trying not to, although my, uh, my Skype connection comes in the midst of... Uh, uh, the various web pages and email feeds and, and such on my computer screen. So there are a lot of distractions going on in front of me, as, as is usually the case when I'm online. Or, or when anyone is online. Uh, what is the central premise of this book? Well, uh, what I argue is that you have to look at the Internet as part of a long history of technologies that have influenced the way human beings think in that uh, different technologies, whether you're talking about the map or the clock or the book uh, or television and now the Internet, emphasize some ways of thinking but de-emphasize others. And what the net does by being such, a, uh, such an interruption machine, such a distraction machine, uh, you know, pumping information at us in all sorts of forms and uh, encouraging us to skip and skim among bits of information is it emphasizes that skimming uh, rapid-fire approach to collecting and processing information but what it de-emphasizes is all the ways of thinking that require attentiveness that require concentration whether it's contemplation or reflection or deep reading or, or even deep conceptual critical thinking uh, there's not much place on the web for those kinds of, uh, of habits of mind, and as a result, I think we're beginning to lose them. Well, is it your perspective, uh, and talking to a lot of uh, neuroscientists and brain researchers, uh, that the Internet is changing how we think, or could it just be perhaps changing uh, what part of our brains are thinking? Well, I think, uh, I think those, two, those two things are, are closely related. Um, it, uh, I think there's a lot of studies that indicate that the characteristics of the web as a communication and information technology, things like multitasking, things like hyperlinks, multimedia, interruptions, all the things that we experience when we go online, they tend to reduce our comprehension, reduce our learning, reduce our understanding. Uh, and so there is a trade-off when you, when you have a technology that uh, exercises certain parts of your brain, uh, but doesn't exercise others. And, and what we, what neuroscientists have learned about the human brain in recent years is that it's very adaptable, even when we're adults. And, and uh, there is something of a use it or lose it quality to the brain. Uh, those things that those aspects of the brain that we exercise get stronger. Uh, they recruit more neurons, literally, uh, into the, into those neural pathways those aspects of mind that we neglect get weaker. Uh, and so we do really do risk losing uh, some capacities, uh, some, some mental capacities that I think are very important to our intellectual lives. So, I mean, this is this concept of plasticity uh, that you and others write about. The brain in some ways can kind of rewire itself in some ways. But, you know, earlier you mentioned new technologies at the time, clocks and maps. Uh, and we humans seem to have adapted pretty well to those, and our brains seem pretty plastic to those. Is there anything about the Internet in particular that leads you to worry more that we won't be able to adapt like we did previously? No, I, I mean, I think we will adapt and we are adapting, but that's, that's the problem. Adaptation is a process of change. Uh, if we didn't adapt, I, it, you wouldn't have to worry about technologies because our brains would work the same no matter what we did. Uh, it's this process of adaptation, which our brains are very good at, uh, that you have to look at uh, very closely because adaptation is a process of change. And so the question is, how is it changing us? How, what's the outcome of this process of adaptation? What are we becoming? What are we losing? What are we gaining? All kind. You know, there's all kinds of different sorts of thinking. I mean, uh, reading a philosophy text is very different than you know, performing music or doing a Sudoku puzzle or something like that. I'm wondering if 
if perhaps some types of thinking uh, are perhaps being diminished uh, by the internet, I wonder if other types of thinking could maybe be strengthening. I think there's some evidence that that there are different aspects of cognition, of thinking, that are probably strengthened by our use of the web, our use of screen technology. Um, for instance, studies of video gaming, which isn't exactly the same as, as the web, but has some uh, correlation, show that probably our ability to shift our attention, to shift our visual focus among lots of different things on a screen can be improved um, uh, by our use of the web, and other kinds of visual processing seem to be strengthened. Unfortunately, um, and there was an interesting study that came out in the, in the magazine Science last year in 2009, those gains in kind of visual processing and those gains in our ability to shift our focus very quickly come at the expense of some of our deeper modes of thinking, our ability to uh, think in conceptual terms, our ability to think in critical terms, our ability to be reflective. So I think, yes, there's, there's trade-offs here, and we have to look at, at both sides of the ledger to understand the full implications and consequences of the net. You know, uh, the net can be communal uh, as it is individual. I'm just wondering how you think this might uh, compensate for, you know, this growing lack of focus. In other words, if my individual thinking is adapting uh, because of my all the time I'm spending on the net, I'm wondering if there's maybe this other sort of side benefit uh, in that the net brings people many different minds together uh, very often, you know, to solve a particular problem or task. I think, um, you know, I think at the problem-solving level, the ability to collaborate and share information quickly can definitely have some benefits um, and gives us new capacities, new social capacities and collaboration capacities that we haven't had before, and I think that's a very important uh, benefit of the web. Um, but again, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't obviate, I think, and it doesn't offset the sacrifices we make in the more solitary modes of thinking, the more uh, the ones that allow us to go deeper uh, and to filter out distractions. Um, and, and I think what we know from a lot of the brain research is the ability to pay attention is what sets off a lot of the most interesting uh, mental processes, processes that we have that enriches our memory, uh, enriches our conceptual thinking. Um, and so again, this is uh, you know this shows that the the web is is very much a a two bladed sword and and cuts both ways. Finally, uh, any thoughts on your part or uh, ideas that perhaps the people you talked to had shared with you um, about how we as individuals might be able to overcome some of these effects that the internet is having on how we think? Well, there's uh, you know. The, the solution is pretty simple. Uh, you, you use your digital technologies less, doesn't mean you don't use them at all, that, that's not, no longer um, practical, but you use them less and you exercise your deeply attentive modes of thinking more, whether it's uh, reading a book or uh, performing a hobby that requires deep attentiveness or listening to a long piece of music. I, I mean, you have to exercise both. What The hard part is not figuring out what to do, the hard part is actually doing it because the expectation of being constantly connected, constantly processing information is now being built very deeply into our work lives. A lot of employers expect us to be constantly connected and it's being built into our social lives. Uh, you see particularly with young people, their friends arranging their social lives through Facebook updates, through tweets, through text messages. So to back away uh, is very hard and requires some sacrifices, maybe career sacrifices, maybe social life sacrifices. But if you value the more attentive, uh, contemplative modes of thought, you, re you really have no choice but to make some of those sacrifices to uh, make sure you continue to be able to have those capacities. Well, Nicholas Carr, uh, thank you so much for helping us focus on this, at least for a little bit, and sharing your thoughts. Nicholas Carr, author of the book The Shallows, thanks for the time. Thank you.